Isn't it great to be out here today? Such a lovely sunny, sunny day. You can really feel how strong the sun is. And uh, it's so that the sun provides us with more energy in 80 minutes than the whole world society consumes in a full year. So the sun is truly a really powerful source of energy. But the fact is that the sun rises in the morning and it sets in the evening. In Sweden, where I come from, we have a lot of sun during the summer and not so much during the winter. Therefore, we have been using wood and later oil and coal to heat ourselves during the winter time and in the evening. And even today, in our modern society, we consume 48% of our energy in Europe for heating and cooling. 25% is transportation, 25% is electricity, but half is in heating and cooling. We consume fossil fuels at a rate that is one million times faster than it took to produce it. So this is sort of the stage, and I'm really happy to see the previous speaker, he sort of set the stage really well. So um, the problem with this is that we want the heat, so we burn something. But in addition to the heat, we produce emissions, CO2 that heats the planet, and air uh, pollution. And air pollution, for example, leads to 10,000 people dying too early each year in Paris alone. And in Europe, on average, we lose two years of our lives. And if we were living in China, this would be seven years. And if we lived in India, 14 years lost per person per on average. So this is the price of using fossil fuel. Not only the long-term price, but the short-term price. So some years back, uh, about 12 years ago, I finished my PhD in nanotechnology. And I made a startup company doing consultancy and production of nanoscale uh, products. And it went uh, quite okay. I could probably have done that today. But I also became aware of this with the energy. And I met some re researchers at a conference in, on Hawaii. Uh, these researchers came from uh, California, from UC Berkeley. And they had the idea of creating a new energy system, a system where sun's energy was stored and released as heat but without the emissions. I thought this sounded really cool and I really wanted to work with something that had a greater meaning. So I decided to stop with the nanoscience and go to Berkeley to work with these people. At the time, this new project did not have a name, but two years later, we had an energy system that we called molecular solar thermal energy storage. It was a system based on the material called ruthenium. It's a very expensive uh, metal and it cost almost the price of gold. So this uh, system, although it worked somewhat, it was never going to make it out of the research lab. So when I, some years later, moved to Sweden to start my own research group, I decided to do something new again. I decided to redesign everything from scratch, and this time only use carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, three of the most abundant elements uh, on the planet. So how does this work? How, does, how is uh, solar energy converted into stored chemical energy? If you think of photosynthesis that is happening in plants and has been here from the onset of uh, life on the planet, we're seeing that the plants are taking in CO2 and solar energy and doing a photochemical transformation of the CO2 into complex chemicals such as cellulose, sugars and other complex chemicals. And it is these chemicals that, that we later burn and create the emissions. So what if we could recreate this process but without the emissions, basically storing the energy, you doing the photochemistry, but not burning anything. This is, this is the idea of my project. So, so we have this now, eight years later, we have this molecule, we can call it molecule A. It absorbs sunlight, it's colored, but when it's absorbing sunlight, it is transformed into, into molecule B. Molecule B can be stored at room temperature for up to 18 years or more, and then when we want the energy back, we trigger molecule B, and then it goes back to molecule A and releases the heat. In that way, we have a cycle with zero emissions, molecule A, input is sunlight, into molecule B, storage, and then we can get the heat out. 
So we have created a new energy system based on carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The system has uh, many other features that are interesting. We have the long storage time, 18 years. We have high energy density, uh, comparable to lithium ion batteries. And we can also heat something with a temperature gradient of 65 degrees. This means that eventually we will be able to produce electricity, cooling, and heating using our energy system, provided that we can make it cheap enough. So what are the next steps for us? H how are we going to take, take this from the basic research lab into real life applications? We are sitting here outside. We are enjoying the lovely weather today, but there are also t times of the day where it's too hot and times of the day where it's too cold. Therefore, we normally, I think most of you live in a house, but we like to like to s live or feel that we are outside. Therefore, we, we have windows in our houses. But the window is a transparent material. We can have light going through the window, but the heat escapes during the day. And it, during the day, we also sometimes get too much heat. Many of you have maybe been sitting in a hot office where the room got too hot. What if we could take our new molecule and integrate it into the window? Then it would absorb the sunlight, store some of it, keep the temperature down, and then release it during the night so that this daily cycle of heating and cooling, heating and cooling can be leveled out. We have calculated that if we can do that, we can improve the efficiency, energy efficiency of a window with at least 33%. So when we got that idea about a year ago, it didn't take us long to construct the first prototype device. And today I actually have it here in my pocket. This is a, a prototype window. It is yellow because it absorbs sunlight. So here you see the yellow coating. This is how the window will look in the morning. But if you are standing out here, the color will rapidly change. But already now I think you can see that it's less yellow. And if we leave this over the night, it will start to send back the energy and recover and be ready for tomorrow. So in this way, we have a window that not only is transparent and it loses energy, but actually con con um, contributes actively to the energy cycle of the house it's placed on. So the next steps for us is to, um, to show that this actually can work for longer periods of time. And we are building the first prototypes of larger scale, uh, the fall of 2019. We're also working on different colors so that you can use uh, yellow or maybe blue or green as design elements in future products. And imagine, I mean, that's, I don't know, I think I've realized all you can use this for. Imagine cars, you go to a hot car in the summer, maybe we could reduce the temperature of that hot car a little bit so then you can into it, it will not be as hot. This is the idea of this material. I love working with solar energy. And the best thing is not that it's uh, for free, it's that Unlike fossil fuels that only belongs to a few countries, the sun shines on everyone on the, full, on the whole planet. So if we create new technologies, it is for everyone. And we actually don't only change what you can do, but also democratize the access to, to energy for everyone. And that can change the world in many different ways, not only making it cleaner. So I hope it will be like the end of the Stone Age. The Stone Age did not end because of the lack of stone but because new technologies were developed. I hope that the fossil fuel age will not end due to the lack of fossil fuels, but because we create new technologies that are clean and emission-free and can be used by everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Casper. Thank you. Any question for Casper? <laughs> Very, very interesting, very mm. fascinating. My, my question is a bit more general. The, mm. the, the fossil fuel, mm. and even uh, nuclear energy, yeah. uh, are uh, massive investments. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, uh, basically, you, um, you, you create uh, power plants for uh, huge, for countries, you mm. even sell abroad, etc. Mm. And what you're developing is very local. It's yeah. one house, one window. Mm. So what do you think is the split, you know, if you have an idea about that, between local uh, energy uh, sources like mm. you're developing and, and, and um, uh, energy sources that you have to uh, put together for uh, huge mm. cities mm. Uh, in the future, you know, to, to uh, go beyond the um, fossil fuels. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not the, the right expert to answer this, but I think that 
the future of energy systems is uh, local. I think this uh, long-term planning is uh, from a time when you have the nuclear power plant you needed to distribute. I think uh, compact energy storage technologies are extremely exciting. Um, and I think uh, many of the energy companies are get going to get problems because uh, today it's uh, cheaper in many places to put up a solar power plant or wind power plant. And as the storage technologies get cheaper, then uh, can change the whole game. The, pro the, the, the problem is uh, uh, about the resources. Many of the new battery technologies require rare materials like cobalt or rare earth materials that can only be mined in China. So that's why I focus my work on only using carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. There's no rare materials in this. This is just a uh, standalone uh, coating. And, and one other thing is that we only exchange windows every 50 years. So the exchange rate of windows is 2% per year. So if I come with a new technology now, it will be over before uh, we have changed it. So it has to be a technology that can be implemented. So this could be implemented in a coating or a film that you add onto windows and then potentially improve the performance of different places. So therefore you can implement it faster. So I think it's important to think about the scale of things, what materials you use, do you uh, use cobalt that only comes from Congo, or do you use something else? I think, uh, and there will not be a single technology that will do everything. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've got many questions I will speak to two. Yeah. One, uh, how much does it cost to mm -hmm. produce your molecule, yes. and can you produce it at scale? Yes. Uh, and the second one is, how do you, how does the, the, the panel that you show mm. gives back the power that it gets in? Mm, mm, we saw it yeah, uh, absorbing the light, yeah. but how do you give it back? Good. So um, <laughs> this molecule in this form, the last question first. The, this molecule absorbs uh, energy and is photochemically transformed into a new molecule that spontaneously, with a certain rate, gives the energy back. So this, uh, uh, this is standalone. There's no electricity. I can just apply this to any surface, and it will automatically, over the course of some hours, give the energy back. So it's a little Which bit... Form? In, fo in form of light heat, or heat, heat, only heat? heat. Yeah, this one is heat. Um, so that was the first question. The second one with the scale. We're working with scalable methods, so there's nothing that stops us from doing it at scale, but of course it has to be developed. It, uh, but uh, there's nothing fundamentally against doing this at scale. We have developed uh, continuous processes without any rare uh, expensive catalysts, so that's okay. The cost is difficult to answer. So we can do some back-on-the-envelope calculations and s estimate that this will be okay, but it's difficult to estimate the economics of scale. So that I don't have the full answer to that. But the th So that we have to elaborate more to, to know the real cost, and that is of course uh, the, the, the decision-making question in terms of business, but I think we need to work more on this to find that out for sure. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Mm. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've got a question. Has the, the heat dissipation is both ways, meaning if you use it as a window panel, it, mm. uh, it is both inside and outside, and what's uh, the ratio? That's the, that's the decision you can uh, make, because uh, depending on where you are, in some countries you want to get rid of the heat, other countries you want to have more heat. So it depends on where you place it. If you have a two-layer window, you can place it on the inside if you want to have the heat, or the outside if you don't want the heat. But, th so this is a d but the special thing here, which sets this material aside from other uh, more classical material like phase change materials is that the input is light and the output is heat. In the traditional phase change material is input is heat, output is heat. So this means that you can place this in different places in a high-tech window because the window is transparent so there's light available everywhere. So this is a different um, design game and this is where I think this is exciting. Oh. Hello. There is this, uh, this works by, uh, I think, uh, a Swiss uh, chemist, Michael uh, Retzel, yes. also, <laughs> on, a, on a titan dioxide. Yes. Are these and not necessary on storage? Is mm. this something that you're working with him? Can you combine? Mm, mm, right. So, so Greg Retzel is very famous for something called disensitized uh, solar cells. So he's also creating, uh, that's um, another technology, where you try to make a solar cell that has a color that can be put into a window. So that is, uh, there you can produce electricity from your window, and you will have a permanent color. It will not be transparent like this. 
and you will need to hook every window up with electricity cables. This is something you can apply to any surface. So there's a lot of smart window technologies coming, mm. and uh, this is uh, maybe one, but there could be other. And um, there's a company in Sweden that just received um, 25 million euro of investment with a very in, in developing Gretzel uh, cells to okay. real market. Um, so it's a really interesting technology. No. I think there's a question here. No. Uh, thank you, very impressive. Uh, how do you measure the, um, the, 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 the ratio? Uh, is it in watts per square meter or um, what is the... Yes, so, so, so we have an incoming light of about 1,000 watts and currently we are storing um, about 4% of that we can capture in the, in the material here. So for example, for one, s one square meter, uh, no. how, ma how many watts do you have if it's a uh, sunny day? Um, you have you get uh, about 1,000 watts from the sun, and maybe 1,500 if you're in France um, per square meter, and then you can store with the current technology 3.8% of that. Uh, then you can release it over the course of uh, 10 hours. Then we have to, I, I don't remember the math on top of my head, but you will get some uh, watts out of uh, this. And then of course, um, yeah, we're working on developing it. We, are, we think we are close to something that is meaningful, Um, and we think we can have the first prototype installed uh, during this year. Um, so you can yeah. store five, four percent yeah, of, of, yeah, of, yeah. of, of yeah. the. Of you will never be able to store one hundred percent. Then it will be a black window. <laughs> you need to have some light coming through. So you have yeah. to make some choices. Uh, and uh, this currently is taking the blue light. We want to extend into other colors, of course. To But it's a design choice. You cannot have any, everything for free. You need to choose some color. And the cool thing about this is that it becomes transparent. It's, mm -hmm. it's the reverse of a normal, these uh, photochromic sunglasses. Mm -hmm. They become dark. This becomes transparent. Thank you. Mm -hmm.